Daha Ismail is a Bangladeshi filmmaker based in London. He's also the co-founder of Collective Unconscious, a creative production studio and collective working across film, music, fashion, and more. Recently, Ta even won gold at the prestigious London Award show for his work. I came across Ta's work first through an incredible viral video of his, back when viral videos weren't even a thing. He had recreated in real life an entire cutscene in the style of popular video game called GTA San Andreas. And today, it might not seem like a lot, but back then, it was quite a big deal. As of now, Ta's work spans across incredible short films to music videos, and his work has also been featured on US television, BBC, film festivals, and many other places. In this episode, Ta and I discuss his journey and what it takes to be a filmmaker in this modern world. Just to note that this podcast was recorded in 2022, and the artwork in the animation was done by the talented Ahmed Fahim. Without further ado, here is Season 3, Episode 9 of State of the Creators featuring Taha Ismail. Hope you enjoy the show. This is State of the Creators, a show about creative individuals who are on a quest to build something out of nothing. Call it um, unconscious world. Straight up, like that's a, first of all a very cool name. Um, second up, why that name to start with? Like why unconscious world? The term actually comes from a concept Carl uh, from Carl Jung. Uh, so it's the idea of the collective unconscious, which is like the unconscious mind is the deepest part of the mind. So there's the there's the general kind of mind you have. Then there's, there's the subconscious level, and then there's the unconscious level. And what he said is basically. Um, people are connected in many ways like even without having like real life experiences and he said ancestral experiences that people can't even describe they're um kind of informed by those behaviors and like these can be deep-seated beliefs memories and this can inform your behavior um and daily life in ways you may not even know so i thought that was a pretty cool concept and working with that and kind of approaching our ideas and concept using using like uh the different di- directors or creatives we have we're trying to like approach it in the way that we want to create some create some uh videos or photos that will that may not necessarily make sense directly but it'll linger on in your mind and create like a thought provoking image or or something like you yeah. might see in some of my works that is like so one or two images might be really random, but people yeah. might try to bring their own meaning out from it. So I thought that with, with, with the company's name would be pretty cool. So, yeah. You know, for, for those who don't know who you are, who is Taha Ismail? Who is Taha Ismail? <laughs> I the existential a... question, straight up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know who I am. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, uh, I am a writer director from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I grew up in Bangladesh, then moved to London to study, and I'm still here. Uh, I've done short films, music videos, fashion films so far, and at the moment, I'm currently... I've, I've finished the second draft of my debut feature film, a screenplay, so I'm kind of still working on that, and hopefully within the next couple of years, either that or another script I would like to go into production with um, and kind of break into my first feature film. Yeah, oh, that's very cool. Because you're also currently studying um, screenwriting, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I recently graduated, so I finished my master's. I was doing screenwriting here. Uh, that ended right. just about last year. So yeah. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. So you've you've graduated from that now, and now basically you're going into doing, as you mentioned, your your own uh, debut feature film, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully in the next couple of years. That's still going to take some time to actually get the ball rolling completely. But um, as of now, it's mainly been freelance music videos, um, yeah. hopefully some more fashion work as well um, as we grow the company. But yeah. Yeah, with because um, you also studied bachelor's in filmmaking as well, isn't it? Like You went to London yeah. to study filmmaking and then you did master's. So, so you've kind of followed the the traditional path that someone would in other industries, right? Like you think of, you know, someone who's wanting to become a doctor or an engineer that have to do the <laughs> masters or bachelors and masters. It's very similar to, to that degree. But the, the, the interesting thing is most creatives actually don't 
go through the route of, of education, at least, you know, um, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. So, so how has it been like for you in terms of getting into film, you know, like film school to start with and then pairing it up with real life application? Because you always hear things like, oh, you don't need to go to school for this, even you're know, not just in the yeah. creative space, but also in a lot of space these days, like, oh, you don't need to, you know, you see those those little uh, memes that you'll see from uh, with the face of Zuckerberg or Elon Musk saying, oh, you don't need to go to school. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. The idea of, of going to school versus real life application in this space specifically, how has that been for you? So I think I kind of agree with with a lot of it where you don't need to go to film school to become like a good filmmaker. I think it's yeah. more about actually doing doing what you're meant to do and then following that. And I think if you're really like if if you work in the industry without having studied film, you you'll still do as like probably even better than someone who studied film. But um where I think film school can help is building networks initially and also the more especially if you go to a practical film school because there's film schools who focus on the theoretical side of things and then you have film schools which are more practical so the one i went to was quite practical and they actually wanted were pretty encouraging towards us when they said they would actually say you can miss some classes if you can show us that you're being on set and you know doing this role that role whatever so a lot of the time students wouldn't actually even be in class they'd be working on other sets um so i was pretty specific in in going down that road because i wanted a practical kind of experience so for me more or less it was pretty pretty good i think and as for the screenwriting aspect, everything happened during COVID. So it was yeah. pretty much all online. Um, yeah. And I was a bit concerned initially, like not going in physically. But the thing is, I knew it's screenwriting. So a lot of writing that I'd have to be doing. So online classes, I was kind of getting used to it by the, by the end of my uh, undergrad. So I was like, you know, I can do this for my master's, considering I'd be doing most of the writing myself anyway. For, right. for the masters so i was pretty pretty chill with um doing an online masters pretty much but i was writing like five to six hours every day wow. um by myself so yeah that was and just then, that was just like one year so the, 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 that still sounds super intense but like writing that much uh, you, because you mentioned that you are a writer you know initially yeah. and did you have the practice prior prior hand like did you used to write stuff out of you know out of hobby or interest like did you write i don't know uh, poems or b- blogs even or is this something you just picked up i never really wrote poems or blogs but i think what i was always interested in was like writing for film or tv and i would write like a lot of these you know pages of pages of um at that point i would just call it content but once I started getting into the habit of following the script form and actually writing down, uh, following the industry standard, writing down dialogues, action, action yeah. lines, all of that. And then once I started getting, getting into that, I started writing more and more scripts. So yeah, I think it just happened in that sense. Right. Uh, just tracking back a little bit with your childhood, uh, it seems like you've always had an interest in filmmaking and you know, a lot of the, um, creative that I speak to sometimes stumble upon what they're doing and then stick with it out of passion because they love it so much. Um, but for you, it seemed like you had this keen interest from, from the get go and you've, you've really had this tunnel vision that, you know, this is what I want to do. Uh, so much so if you've, if you've studied, you're you know, working on it right now, you're, you're working on so many different projects all related to that. Um, what was that spark? you know, that created spark for you early on that made you think that, you know, this is the route that I want to want to go on. I mean, I think, I don't know if you know, but um, I used to run this YouTube channel back in the day um, I called TATVN. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we used to make a lot of these real life version videos of like GTA. And, I'm, I'm going to come, I'm going to, you know, get, get into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we kind of, initially I was, so how I got into film was actually, I was into sports, but I got injured once and I was like bedridden for a little while. And I just started watching a lot of these YouTube videos and films. And I said, you know, I'll try this out. It looks cool. So I started making videos with some family friends and kind of got into YouTube doing that. And then 
I I was watching a lot of films and shows, so I was like, you know what? If I start going down this road and and start making short films, maybe that's where my passion lies. And then I started experimenting, and eventually, within like a couple of years, I realized that I do want to kind of do this professionally. So that's how it happened. Yeah. Wow. So so you know, a lot of with you, YouTube was the spark for you to become more creative and, and follow that path. Yeah. Initially, we started making like these kind of spoofs and you know content like that so i was watching freddie wong a lot and i i, I was impressed by all of the stuff he yeah. was doing so we yeah i think it kind of sparked from there and then got more into like the film side of things yeah right and and you know it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because um just as i was setting up this um this this call uh or this podcast and i sent you a link the last message i had that I sent you on Facebook was years ago and said that, you know, I love the GTA video. Let's, let's keep in touch. And, and it's because I remember how viral it went. And it was before, because right now you see a lot of those similar videos everywhere. Mm-hmm. But I remember, when was it, 2014, 15? Was it, was it around that time? I think the first one was 2014 and the second one was maybe two years later or something like right. that. Right. So, yeah. so for those who are unaware, um, it was basically uh, a video of a recreation of the GTA San Andreas, was it? Um, yeah. So the first one was, um, first one was just a recreation and the second one was a recreation of San Andreas in Bangla. So yeah, exactly. And, and, <laughs> and I remember it going viral at the time and, and I found that you know, not only it was it was hilarious, but what I loved the most about it was the attention to detail. I think, and and you know, I'm, I love details in in everything, and mm. just very orientated towards those those minor things. But what popped out for me for those videos was that you were paying attention to the to the sound, uh, you know, the, the effects, the the camera angles as well, uh, the dialogues, and, and everything just made sense in, in a lot of ways that, you know, this is what it would feel like if it was created or recreated in real life. And and at that time, I didn't see anything like that around. And, and yeah, it was, it was super cool. But what made me, I guess, you know, my next question would be like, like, you got into YouTube doing these kind of things. What made you stop? Because obviously today YouTube is, I would say, huge compared to even the days of 2014 and 15. And, yeah. and people have lucrative careers in, in, in the world of YouTube. And it sometimes even, uh, you know, complements a, a, a more creative pathway. So, so why did you stop, especially when you were getting kind of good traction at the time? I think what I getting kind of good traction wanted at the time. was... I don't know if it's like selfish or not, but I just wanted everything that we did to be like this memory from my from my school school year. So that channel just became like everything I did with friends, family while I was still in that age. And I, I and I th- I don't know. A lot of people still ask me like, would would you go back to the channel and you know post something now, for example? And I just kind of look at it as like something that I had, like something that I can look back. Let's say in in. 10 years time you know and just be like oh we did this really cool thing when we were young and like everything's like all all still there you know so right. a funny thing is every year almost every year like all of yeah, my friends yeah. and we just gather and just re-watch some of these videos in one day and just like think think about how the good times were back then just laugh it off you know like oh this is so cheesy you know whatever but you no know, it's just uh, yeah. reminiscing about good times we had i think and i wanted it to be a memory so so that's what it is for me now. Yeah. Well, it's almost like a time capsule you've created for yeah. yourself right i think it's just something you can go back to and, and in some ways it's you know i want to draw parallels to a musician like you know when when they release albums they sometimes think of those as representative of their mind and you know of their life at the time um and sometimes when you, you know, a lot of artists if you go back and tell them that hey um it's been a few years why does your sound you know, but like seem different. Yeah, yeah, Why yeah. can't you go back to doing all? They'll be like, nah, I want to keep that as, you know, that's a separate thing. And I want to keep doing what I'm doing right now. It almost feels like, like that for you, but you know, YouTube obviously has grown so much over the years. What do you think of the medium in general? Like, do you still follow a lot of YouTubers? Do you watch YouTube? And, and do you in fact think you can use YouTube as a way to, way to amplify what you're doing from a creative, creative space? Because, 
there is obviously an oversaturation of, of I don't want to, you know, uh, sound too elitist, but uh, oversaturation of, of, um, of content uh, versus creative things that we sometimes think that resides outside of YouTube. But obviously there is that cross section where both of those things exist. So for you, do you think you can use YouTube as a way to amplify what you're doing down the, down the line? I think you, YouTube is still like amazing. It's changed a lot. And I think I haven't been in touch with YouTube as much as I used to be just because I was like on YouTube a lot before. Now, whenever I'm YouTube uh, on YouTube, I listen to like podcasts or, or, you know, watch these little snippets of, of like different interviews and things like that. But I don't think I've like religiously subscribe to any channel and follow like every upload or anything like that um i think one pet peeve of mine is like even when i upload on youtube the quality of the file decreases so significantly i just like i'm like oh you know like um I, vimeo in, in that regard like especially with grain like having to go yeah. through all of this stuff and you know adjust it for youtube but that's just like my thing i still think it's an amazing platform for creators and sure. even i think i would be using it down the line maybe maybe not personally or my work would be on there as a way to support the actual release or or something like that you know yeah right well that makes sense um i want to kind of Fast forward to your graduation film, which was This Is Me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It came out last year, uh, pretty much during the pandemic, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think we released it online like November 2020. Yeah. Right, like towards the yeah. end of 2020. And, um, uh, you know, I first of all, uh, anybody who hasn't seen it, definitely go check it out. I'll have the links in, in all the description. But it's, um, I love the film. You know, I, I have got this creative newsletter, which I sent out, and I remember putting it there. And a few people came back to me and said, oh, this is, this is really cool. I think a lot of people could relate in in some ways, obviously, not maybe not in the, in the ways that you've shown. But I think a lot of the people like ourselves we are quite hybrid in the in the idea of identity of cultural um having our place in in two different cultures um and this constant battle uh, that we have with trying to find our place really um and i think what you've done with with uh, with that short is, is really highlighted in, in in a in a more you know turned up way um in a more amplified way or, or maybe in a, in a more natural way for a lot of you know people who, who can relate so for you, though, why did you decide to go in and create something that's very rooted to your your identity, or or at least questioning that 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 identity that you have? Ah, oh, that's a that's an interesting question. I think first of all, thank you. Uh, I remember you sent it out in the newsletter, uh, and yeah, I think um, identity right now is like everyone's you know talking about it like diversity is booming right now everyone wants like diverse shows all of that um but for me i think a lot of the the story came from like seeing people growing up and then a lot of it is personal experiences a lot of it is um talking to uh, talking to different friends many people um both in bangladesh and in the uk so i i thought at that point it seemed like the best like for because we had been given a brief like we had to make a short film within like 15 min 15 to 20 minutes and for me at that time i think that story was what i really wanted to tell like i had to i i spoke to many people and it's not just one experience that i tried to show in the film i, I was restricted in terms of time but i had to try to show the supporting characters stories as well as as much as i could with with what i had but i think yeah, I think it was just a bit close to heart for me. And after sending the film out, like people watching it, getting messages from people who resonated with it, not necessarily even coming from the same background, they were yeah. able to relate to it. And this is like people who I haven't spoken to in ages messaging me, people I don't know messaging me. So that was very powerful. And I think I never really experienced something like that before. And that kind of reminded me that film is an important medium a medium and if used correctly it can touch people yeah. with with you know staying on the identity side of things um it, it uh, again like going 
back to the idea of of ourselves as these hybrid children of the of the globalized world right we've got the bangladeshi route but you still have been you know, living in london i've been living in australia and, and there's always the battle as i mentioned um and 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 i think a lo- we're we're starting to wear it as a badge these days and i think i think that's what was cool to see in your work that is that you were you're wearing it with, with pride because previously i think a lot of us would would be confused as to oh, which one do I do I choose and sometimes you get mm. pressurized by the society it's like oh if I say something good about this then I mean, do I you know am, am I foregoing my previous identity and vice versa right um but I think you're you've kind of taken it on 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 the sleeve and be like you know this is this is just who I am <laughs> this is me right yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. um and and uh, you know, that's what I love but going into the future it it do you feel like once you've told that that story of identity uh, would you be able to manage that going forward bring that up again for your future works like do you think you're going to use that same kind of because you've kind of told the story now right so as a, as a creative how, how would you manage that because this is still something we want to talk about continuously right i think as i as i grow up and people like sense of identity evolve as they grow as well so some things might say stay the same some things might be different but i think essentially it's a human story so we mm. a lot of these are archetypal stories will kind of be the same but just little details will change and and that's how i guess it'll be original in its own sense but right now i think what's really popping off like everywhere is people's own like people shouldn't have to hide who they are you know mm. like if the the more vulnerable and honest you are you're going to be able to make something good out of it i think yeah. so yeah you mentioned a lot of people resonated with something like that um how do you cater to an audience that's that's beyond the background that you're from because you have an international you're living in london you have you know teachers who don't speak the same language as you you have you know um, viewers who who won't necessarily understand where you're coming from so so how do you tackle that from from providing your own story but then to an audience that may not always be on that same wavelength um for me so far what i've been noticing is of course you have to have like something a, a bit of it in mind like oh what's going to work for the market you know a little bit even if it's not primarily that because that sometimes can hamper your creative vision as well if you're just focusing mm-hmm. on the market side of things um the the kind of road that i try to go forward with is like i tell my story to someone let's say in real life they will probably resonate with it not because they're from the same background but just because human beings have empathy and they can relate to one another even if they haven't li- have like the same lived experience they kind of see themselves in you for that specific moment let's say and that's why a lot of these stories that even for example let's say it's a medieval story you might not relate to it because you weren't in that you know time time space yeah. or like environment but it's it's the character and the stories that kind of happen over time it's the same thing is just told in told in different ways here and there but the essence of of like pretty much every story is like it's th- i don't know if you know it's something called the hero's journey you might have heard of it yes but yeah, yeah. yeah most kind of like all adventure story especially but yeah it's all rooted in this one concept but right yeah everything else is like original in that sense because of how it's kind of evolved yeah you've also been venturing to the world of music videos you've worked with um, the mirror and a little late you know two of my favorite artists that are coming up yeah. uh you know in the in the bangladeshi music scene um doing pretty cool stuff and and you've made uh, i think a video each for 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 them um how does making a music video compared to making a short film for you in terms of creative processes oh it's actually in some ways it's similar but it's actually quite different because now you're you're working with with another person for their vision as well for something for a piece that they've created but now mm-hmm. you're coming up with an idea of how you pictured it in your head let's say yeah. so um 
for example, I'll tell you with, with the story with Lil Late, it happened very out of the blue. Like I was in, I was going to be in LA. I just reached out to him like, you know, can we make this happen? Send, send me some of your new tracks. And he was, we always wanted to work together, but that kind of just happened and we made it happen. I went and stayed with him. And I think staying with him for those five, six days and then actually shooting kind of gave me more time to like spend time with him, get to know who he is. Um, mm-hmm. We met briefly before, but actually spending time with him like that. Yeah. And then I actually had a like rough idea of what the video is going to be like when I heard the track, but then spending time with him and then making that treatment all, like together and then you know, coming up with coming up with ideas and I always had had this specific image of of like little late videos, like oh, it's LA, yeah. you know, at night, col- yeah. vibrant colors, all of that stuff. And I was like, I have to, you know, go down this road, do it in my way, because I'm very inspired by films like Nightcrawler, Drive, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. I really wanted to put my own twist to it and see where it goes. And Sean was really, really open to like anything I was putting on the table, and he was down to do whatever. Um, so it was really cool working with him and I hope I can like work with him again. But how it's different from short I think I moved from what the original question was. <laughs> That's fine. I think That's how yeah. how it differs from short films is short films are more or less what I, when I've written them it's mainly been me writing it and then directing it myself is just my solo vision kind of a thing, you know. Right. So comparing that to a music video where the song is coming from an artist it's their piece as well you kind of have to maintain that in your mind while you're creating like a brief for them or or like a concept for them so it's a mixture of those two things yeah and short films i I think feel more in because it's more of a journey because it's longer to film you've spent weeks months researching writing stuff going through redrafting with music videos it's a bit faster yeah. um less shoot days but usually usually music videos can be like three to four minutes sometimes it's longer but short films are generally like 15 minutes you know 15 10 15 minutes so in that sense you spend a lot more time with it so it, it, both of them are your babies but it's like you kind of prefer you know like the short film in a way just because you've put more into it i guess yeah. and it's like your own thing completely yeah i mean i mean props to sean and i guess the damir as well where because you're you know uh presenting your your ideas and then they have to because it, it is also their baby and i did and it's their music yeah. right and then someone else coming in and viewing it from their angle then providing ideas and then being okay with with working on i think it's it's a super kind of you know creative collaborative process but do you kind of see yourself like do you when you listen to the songs that you're making music videos for do you as a as a as a, as a consumer of, of audio do you then go into their mindset and do you get get into their point of view or do you, do you try to reflect your own angles into that that you know this is how i'm taking it and this is how i'm going to going to show it so far it's it's actually been like i'll hear the track i'll get some specific images in my head it could be related to the lyrics it might not be but yeah i sometimes get like really vivid images of like it could be the instruments it could be the way he said they've said a particular line yeah. and that will just evoke these emotions and these images in me and i'll present it to them and most of the times they're they're down down to go down that route and like they'll offer their own like view but I think it hasn't been the case yet where it's just someone's given me like a like a complete brief of this is how I want it and then you have to follow this because if I'm not being able to contribute how how I kind of see the images in my head, then it would be a bit difficult for me to produce something like that as well, I think. Yeah. Um just staying on to the the work you've done with Chan, um, he you also made this fashion film um, for for a brand called Sick. I think is that the way you say it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sick, honestly, yeah. one of my favorite things that you've done. It's 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 really cool. Just the way it looks and um, yeah, it's just beautiful. To be fair, uh, but uh, the my question 
goes into a more of a different route is uh, stuff like this don't really get as much recognition as they should in my opinion especially in the in the scene that you would we see in, in in Bangladesh and even though the the scene is growing you know some some great stuff that's happening visually you know with people like you know, Nuhash and, and so many others trying to level up their game um but it still feels like there's this the ceiling for for appreciation of, of certain things um do do you feel the same and and if you do how, how do you go about that like do you do you, does that ever stop you from thinking that I don't want to do stuff for this region I would rather do something else or or do you not think about that at all and you just create um i have thought about that i mean i've i've thought about that before but not too deeply because i think i i do want to create my like whatever i want to create but i think i'm trying to find this like middle ground between between places like what works where but also i you you kind of have to make things that like uh how do i explain it let's say so i don't want to spoon feed audiences right i i want to present something new and then a lot of the times when people are watching things like it's the audience's job to also ex- experience new things you know mm-hmm. so in like in bangladesh some of these some of these videos may not be as popular because the masses kind of prefer you know different content but how i see it is if i can find the middle ground where i i make what i want to make but also can appeal to people mm-hmm. like majority of the people are like a certain group of people then i think that works for me but then what happens to the scene if for example you know say say making something like the the fashion film you did uh, the fashion film you did for for sick right it's obviously took resources it took time it took a lot of energy um but you won't see something like this coming up again because of the fact that it's not being appreciated on on a larger scale mm. so so do you think that's actually hurting the the scene to an extent or do you think you know the market's the market audience is the audience whatever will happen will happen almost by by you know uh, the cambrian explosion almost <laughs> i mean it's a, it's a hard one because i don't see films like little commercials like that in bangladesh like making impact in terms of like brands actually making films making sales and stuff because right, you'd right. r- rather go down the traditional road of advertising for yeah. that but for example in in like other parts of the world you'll see a lot of lot of commercials like this, especially like hugo boss exactly. or, or exactly. the, a really lot of their well. commercials are are similar yeah so i guess it just depends on how tastes evolve it might hurt like filmmakers it it actually won't hurt filmmakers making those with companies it's, it might hurt the companies and they might decide not to do something like that in the future but this is the other thing like i don't know how much you can expect a country stays to change within like a small period of time it's just like such a long process so mm. yeah it's it's a tough one i think i don't really have a concrete answer to that so so what is quality to, to you when it comes to seeing something visually or or a film like when you look at something um what when do you think that you know what this is this is quality for me i think visually if i'm thinking visually it would be like how how the colors are i i i really look into that and i think visually if the image is nice uh nicely lit colored that that's like something i enjoy but more so i'm rather driven by like micro micro expressions in in like performances and then if a story resonates with me that's that's the best thing like if i can feel myself in one of the characters or if some not necessarily that has to happen and i just enjoy a story and like it mm-hmm. can give me goosebumps or or something like that then i'd say the quality is pretty high it doesn't necessarily need to have like the bet not need to be shot on the best cameras or anything like that it's more so the way it's sometimes low low quality footage actually works wonders because yeah. it's more raw and honest in that sense so it really depends on on the project but for me it would be those things i think yeah just tracking back a little bit you know you, you just the idea of of trying to study filmmaking is a brown kid coming coming out of bangladesh did you have um supportive parents in that regard uh who were okay with you or did you have to fight your way 
uh, trying to trying to do what you're doing. So my, I think my story is a bit weird because I initially didn't want to go to university at all. I just wanted to like start working on like film straight away or whatever. My initially when I got into film, my both of my parents thought it was a hobby and didn't thought I didn't take it seriously. But then my my mother would be like, oh, you know, he's doing this as a hobby. My dad would always encourage me. Both of them would encourage me, yeah. but they never thought I, initially that I would go down this road. Yeah. And then I think I won won this award once back back in Bangladesh. And that's when they were like, oh, so this is like, you know, getting serious now. Yeah. And then they were both supportive pretty much. I can't say they haven't been. Yeah. So I've been very lucky in that sense. Um, they actually pushed me that, you know, if you're, because I didn't want to study, like I was never really a keen student or anything. So they said, if you are going to study, like you might as well study film. So in that sense, they were pretty encouraging towards me to actually go to film school. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, do you get into creative ruts? Like, like creative hundred percent. I think everyone, I think every creative gets into ruts. Um, like, what's yeah, a creative rut for you? Because obviously, with, with filmmaking, it's it's you don't have to come up with something on the day, right? Um, a lot of the time, yeah. you have that flexible idea if you're working on your personal projects. But I understand if you're working with big production companies, you obviously have deadlines that you have to meet and come up with creative things yeah. on those on those time spans. So, for you personally, how do you know how, how do those creative ruts look like? Um, sometimes I can be like stuck, like it, it happens during editing. It happens during writing, I think, but I don't face it that often primarily because, um, I, I just am not in that space at the moment where I'm churning out projects like back and forth, like regularly, you know, so I have some time to actually sit down and think, but a lot of the times I think where, when I do get into creative ruts, I can just feel like not motivated to continue with that specific piece so i'll maybe start doing something else which then brings me back give me like a fresh sense right. when i come back to this project so it could be like even just i like going out for a walk sometimes just to clear my mm -hmm. head and that that does wonders actually for me where i don't listen to music i'm just out there for a little while mm -hmm. and then come back and then it's it's like almost starting from scratch in a way but, uh, just yeah. just tracking back on something you mentioned that you know during your your masters for screenwriting you you'd have to write so many pages and pages per day it's almost like a practice that you'd have to do regardless do you think that ever helped with your creative blog because you have to produce stuff because and then you just have to push things out anyway so the thing was actually we never were forced to like write five to six it was like how man, how much right. you want to do like it's up to you but when I re this never happened to me before because that was the first time I was writing a feature film. And yeah. um, when you get into the flow state of writing writing a feature film, I think that is one of the best right. best experiences because you're writing and it's like so much fun. It's like I can't actually explain it. Like I I don't I've never really experienced something like that. So I would be hanging out with friends and I'd tell them, look, I have to go home because I have to wake up tomorrow and write. Five, and I would actually look forward to waking up every day incredible. and doing that. It became a routine. So now, like once I think you get into that flow state, you don't want to get out because I always kept thinking, oh no, if I, if I like leave now, will I just switch off and not be able to like continue the way I'm doing? You know? uh, do yeah. you have a routine per se now? Uh, right now, I, I have like a flexible routine. Um, I was never really a morning person, but I've become a morning person recently um kind of wake up go go have my everyday you know coffee walk come back and then start working but when i was writing the feature film what my routine was was that i'd wake up um eat breakfast whatever and then for a straight like within the next eight hours i'd try to get like five hours of writing done and i'd have like little breaks in between um and at that time, I was living in like a co-living space, so I would have like right. other people around me, even though it was the pandemic. Yeah. So I have these brief interactions with people that would kind of take my mind off of writing, but then I, I'd be able to jump straight back into it. Right. Um, where do you draw your day-to-day -day inspirations from, like, say, for your films, or just do you watch other films, or do you kind of 
try to stay away from other films because you a lot of artists sometimes st- stay away from the source that you're trying, they're trying to make because mm. you can kind of you know mistaken not mistakenly but almost subconsciously pick up two similar uh parallels so so what's your general inspiration taking is like that's very interesting you mentioned that because i was actually talking about this with a friend a couple of days ago and i used to watch one film a day like back when i was in bangladesh i would watch one film a day because it would inspire me i would just that was like my go to thing look forward to doing that every day but then as you grow up grow up and then you have more stuff happening it's just impossible to like yeah. watch one film a day but i also realized that like you said subconsciously i was getting influenced by all these films and i thought to myself like everything's a, yeah everything's like not original anyway everything's a copy of a copy exactly. but what if i you know try this try this experiment where i don't watch films regularly at all you know so i stopped kind of i didn't stop watching films it's just like i stopped watching as much as i was watching um and i think that kind of helped me find my own voice in in certain ways but i also felt like i was missing out not you know watching like things that were coming yeah. out so it was like a bit of a contradiction yeah, yeah. so like for two years i didn't really watch many films to be honest and i tried to kind of stay like avoid it basically and and kind of come up with my own things but now i'm slowly getting back into watching more things because i feel like it's just it's just not that black and white where you just quit watching something and you know you're going to be original or or something like that you yeah, do i agree i think or it's like like think like being original is is too overrated like uh, you, you you in terms of the idea that you can you have to obviously aim for being original but this idea that everything is original and nothing is taken from something else you know that it's pure genuine unique piece of art i don't think exists anymore i think we're we've gotten to a point yeah. where you can always draw lines or or draw parallels from 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 things of the past like easily there's only so many notes on on the yeah. guitar there's only so many framing that you can do there's only so many stories you can tell right yeah, yeah, yeah. um so so i'm 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 completely on board with you on that and actually i've been thinking about this a, a fair bit and the more i think about it the more i land on the camp that you know originality is, is a myth uh, in today's world so completely yeah agree with you on that um what's what's your dream collab like who would you love to work with it either in terms of you know part of the team or someone you want to work with who will act out your your writing mm. i think i think riz ahmed to be honest i i really I look up to riz ahmed as a creative yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah he's got like i don't really have like cuz he's an actor and and nowadays he's writing yeah. as well so i don't really have like people who are actors as inspirations just like more so like directors mm-hmm. i think but him the the work he's done and he's doing like has been so like inspirational for me in like many aspects like both his music as well as as well as his his film so i think working with him would be pretty pretty dope yeah um we towards the end of the end of the episode uh anyway but uh one of the kind of outro questions that i usually have is what what's your personal goal in the next 5 years oh next 5 years i mean ideally hopefully i'm in, in the next couple of years i'm trying to um raise the funds for making this making this feature film which would be the debut feature film and um yeah whether or not it happens in the next 5 years i'm going to be working on it and then i'll see where it goes but i at the same time i also want to grow the company that we've started and and you know do music videos commercials um i'm trying to also do like a couple of short films within within like the next mm-hmm. year and yeah hopefully in let, like because you said 5 years let's see if by then you start hearing about my my w feature it would be pretty sick if that happened but to to yeah. your point when you mentioned that you know I'll be looking to raise funds like how does the mechanism work so if somebody were to uh, if an aspiring filmmaker were to make a feature film how how would the process look like um 
it, it can be it can vary but usually what happens is you let's say you have the script ready you send it out to producers who will then if they're already well connected they'll share it amongst like the people mm-hmm. they know try to raise funds but they might have like a production company that they work out of or like some sometimes you have grants as well so like um the BFI the British Film Institute they have specific grants like oh we'll give you like a million pounds yeah. or whatever to you know make this film but it's very competitive to actually get those grants because like a lot of people are applying for it and um if if you're like i guess lucky enough for your debut feature script to be picked up by a producer and then produced then that's amazing but i think we're going to have to look at all those all those options yeah. when we're sending it out to producers and like uh fi- like screen uh, screenplay festivals grants all these different funding schemes yeah. fair enough um finally what are three actionable steps that you can suggest someone who wants to walk down the path of becoming a filmmaker um i think work on your craft as mu- as much as possible whether it's like writing um just even going shooting stuff like let's say you write something down short like whatever it is just go shoot it do it over and over again and then you'll start to see progress and get on get on more sets um don't be afraid of experimenting uh and working in different roles and yeah just find your voice in that sense and I think music can also help a lot in terms of like idea generation getting things done. Um yeah, those those three things I think. Yeah. Um but what kind of music do you do you usually listen to to get get inspired? Um I listen to a lot of electronic like instrumental music so I think why why that works for me is because when when there's lyrics you kind of have a story that's going on with the track and you're picturing right. that in your head so there's actually a playlist on Spotify i can recommend it's called beats to think to and it's it's like a lot of these kind of what what genre is it it's like down tempo techno like ambient, kind of tracks stuff? that or are like lo-fi ambient a- a- ambient uh not lo-fi it's more like ambient electronic right. slash techno tracks which because of the repetitive beats it kind of makes your brain think in different right. ways and i think that is very helpful for writing running yeah. working out But you know th- that's yeah. super interesting because when you mention lyrics i think it's it's so true you start thinking of what the the writer's trying to say so you wouldn't listen to instrumental stuff yeah. it's very much like the score of a film Yeah basically and you can come up with your own yeah. story and like let's say you were thinking of doing a music video for the yeah. track you would listen to the track and because there's no lyrics you all of the the instruments would influence your ideas in in that sense so fantastic yeah. well Daha this was a pleasure thanks for coming on I appreciate the work that you do and the thank you so much for having me no no of course i think uh, hopefully yeah. in a few years yeah. time we'll we'll be seeing um seeing your feature film and i don't know f- in 5 years we'll probably see you on the oscars just make sure you know you stay on <laughs> you stay clear of will smith that's all that, that, that's <laughs> oh my god yeah that's that's still, it's still yeah I, it, i think it's dead but i bought yeah. it up, so <laughs> now nah, that's st- i think that's still going to be like on everyone's feeds for like a little while but um hopefully we can meet each other in person at at some point as well you know um yeah, that would be sure. cool but cool partner thanks for